Okay, so in this uh, video we're going to uh, have a look at the issue of external economies of scale and trade and look at how um, uh, these um, this type of economies of scale can obviously uh, lead to lower costs uh, um, for the world, in other words for everybody, but also how sometimes we can get the situation where a country who perhaps should be producing a particular good, in other words, with in terms of its endowments and, and, and its returns to scale, increasing returns to scale, perhaps could be producing this good, but is not producing this good. Uh, in other words, um, the results or the, the, the um, benefits of trade, of international trade, are not obvious because uh, there are certain other factors almost preventing them from doing so. And we'll talk about the implications of that as well. So just quickly here, in terms of these uh, economies of scale. So one way to think about this, it doesn't always happen like this, but let's think in terms of clusters. Right? Clusters in production are really common. And there's a whole wealth of um, literature on this actually. So uh, some really simple examples that we're all kind of aware of. We've got Silicon Valley in California, um, New York in terms of finance, um, Hollywood, Bollywood, um, Bangalore is um, very has a, an awful a disproportionate number of IT companies, and so on and so forth. So there's lots of geographical areas where a particular industry, a particular good or a service is disproportionately produced. Here's a quick um, uh, map, I guess, of Silicon Valley. And so you can see at the top here, we've got San Francisco and Oakland. Uh, across the across the bridge, uh, all the way basically through to San Jose, and in between you've got all of these IT companies. You can you can you can go through this at your own leisure. But use IBM. Um, where's Microsoft? Microsoft is somewhere around here, I think. Um, uh, oh no, there's HP. Oh, there's Microsoft there. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Sanyo, Philips. You know, it, it it goes on and on and on. Yahoo here. So the question then is, well, what, why are they all clustered together? And particularly in if a lot of these companies are digital, there's really no reason physically for them to be together. Is there? It's not the production of, of a lot of this stuff is, is intellectual kind of property, not, not physical property. Sometimes it is, but quite often it's, it's not. So why are they here? Why are they all clustered around this this place? In China, a slightly different issue in this um, uh, in this graphic. What I've got here is the Chinese cities with the number of clusters. In other words, the number of different industries that all cluster there. So you can see with the the larger red dots are places where um, You've got uh, what is that? Uh, with cities with six clusters, so they have in this little area in here. We've got electric wires, um, um, T-ware electronics. Uh, we've got IT circuit boards, apparel, silk textiles, eyewear. Each of these are clusters. Okay, but we're obviously not suggesting that all of these industries are related to each other necessarily, but um, they are clusters of products. Sometimes we also get though related industries. So um, an example of this uh, might be a car components, just skipping just ahead a little bit here. So you've got car producers who are actually producing the car itself, but of course a car requires you know, numerous um, bits and pieces, um, both for the original car itself, but then of course also for um, spare parts and supplies um, for later. And uh, so what we often find is in related industries, they all cluster together as well. Car component suppliers, the ones who make the bits and pieces, have an incentive to be near the car manufacturers. And of course, the car manufacturers have an incentive to be located near the car component makers. And so they all tend to physically cluster together. So the greater the concentration, usually, not always, but usually the greater the efficiencies. And then just popping up here about in terms of the reasons why, and you can see, for example, things like um, uh, with Silicon Valley, we said there's, n there's not for many of them, for a couple of them, there's nothing really physical here, but there is a lot of this aspect, okay? And to be honest, this aspect too, all right? 
So people cluster in Silicon Valley because they have people, other people very close to them who are also in related industries and who also understand and have skills in that area. So there's a lot of um, ideas, if you like, that are, that are swimming around in um, Silicon Valley. And, you know, despite the almost the irony of it being um, a digital type thing, there is still the issue of physical proximity. You know, talking to someone who, who's an, an electrical engineer about a particular problem that you've got or talking to a software engineer and talking to them physically and, and developing ideas face to face is still very powerful. So there's different reasons why um, these clusters occur. Okay. Uh, another quick example, and I'm going to use this example as we sort of go forward, is the button market yeah, for whatever reason. So back about whatever, 30 odd years ago, uh, a very small business has started uh, by picking buttons off the street, three brothers. Today, this area produces 60% of the world's buttons. So clearly there's some big external economies of scale here. But what we want to do is we want to say, okay, so if a country overall has, um, has these external economies of scale, what does that mean in terms of international trade? We're, we're talking, we've been talking here about within a country, but what does that mean when you open up to trade? That's what we want to examine here. So remember the whole thing with these economies of scale is this forever downward sloping average cost curve. So the larger the industry, the lower the industry's cost. So in other words, as you move down the demand curve, so as production increases to meet the demand, the costs fall. So this is what we call this forward falling. We can call it forward sloping, whatever. Uh, supply curve. The larger the industry's output, the lower the price at which firms are willing to sell. So here I've got two countries. I've got the US, uh, US and China. Uh, in um, well, in this particular industry, you can see that average costs in China are considerably lower than in the US. So if they were both internally, if they were, if there was no international trade, the price that US consumers would pay for this good is is there, but the price that Chinese consumers pay is down here because its average costs are lower. Then we've got this. The next question, of course, is well, what if we open up to trade? What's going to happen here? Well. Basically, the Chinese buttons are cheaper. The China button industry will expand while the US button industry will contract. And this is not a stable equilibrium. In other words, this will keep happening and keep happening and keep happening. China expands because as China expands, its costs get even lower. And as the US industry contracts, its average costs get higher. And so basically, you end up at the end of the day, as I said here, the process almost feeds on itself and so in theory, all button production will be in China and the US industry or the US will produce zero buttons. We can see this on a diagram pretty simply. Here I've got, so that's, a, that's the domestic internal, if you like, demand for buttons in China. This is the world demand, so obviously further out to the right. We can talk about the scale of this, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that obviously world demand is higher than domestic Chinese um, demand. So international trade, if we think about China's average cost. I could have drawn here um, the US's average cost, but let's focus on the Chinese situation here. Again, if they were closed, they would produce it at a price of P1, but as the industry expands, as demand increases, they're able to, because of these economies of scale, produce this um, button, uh, produce these buttons at an even lower price. So Therefore, if we have the situation where a country has these economies of scale, has this comparative advantage in producing most or all of the um, output of this good, is this actually going to happen? In other words, is this what we always see? Well, the answer is sometimes we do, absolutely. But sometimes we don't. One of the main reasons why we sometimes don't see this, in other words, we don't see that there's, there is a country that could produce it for a lower cost, but is not. All right, the actual, actually the higher cost country has actually got the, the dominant position in this particular uh, market. So quite often it's historical, yeah? It's, this is what we call in, well, we call in economics, but other disciplines use it, path dependence. Why are we good at it? We're good at it because we've always been good at it, yeah? 
So the country that has the advantage because it has historically always produced that good has, you know, is able to continue producing that good, even though somewhere in the world there is another country that could be producing this, and the and the I guess the emphasis here is on could be producing this good at a lower cost. So what we we want to finish off this uh, brief look at um, economies of scale by looking at why sometimes they don't. Okay, so let's take an example. All right, let's say that Vietnam in theory could produce buttons at a cheaper average cost than China. So you can see here, Vietnam's average costs are less than China. We've got the current world situation. Here's the the world demand curve. So as it currently stands, you know you've got China producing this good or all of the world's output at a price of P1. Now, of course, from what we've what we can see here is that we can see that in theory, Vietnam, of course, could be producing this, and they sh perhaps should be producing this, all of the world output, at this P2. They've got lower average costs, and if they're allowed to, or they're able to produce it, then what we should be finding is that Vietnam produces all buttons, China produces zero buttons. Yeah. But what if they're not actually producing buttons? What if this is only a relatively recent thing, and they've gone, oh, hang on a sec, we've got this we could have this comparative advantage in um, buttons. Well, the key to the problem here is in this average cost curve. When you're not producing anything or much, this is where they would have to start off with, up here at P3. Because you can't, you know, it takes these economies of scale, it takes this higher production to be able to lower your costs, go down along this, um, this cost curve. So at the start, even though in theory if they produced enough they'd get the economies of scale to make the price a lot lower at P2, they can't because when they start off the average costs are going to be higher and in particular of course it's higher than what is currently the situation. In other words it's higher than what China is currently producing at P1. So what happens? China keeps making the buttons, Vietnam produces zero buttons. Now the interesting thing about this is that this actually, one of the consequences or one of the um, possible policy implications of this is that Vietnam would actually be better off or could be better off with no international trade. In other words, if they either banned the import of buttons from China or set ridiculously high tariffs or whatever um, prevents, if you like, um, the exports coming in, if they were to purely do their own thing then what would be the situation? So let's have a look at the, the Vietnam, of the demand for buttons in, in Vietnam. Okay, so again, thinking, getting away from uh, the current situation, which is China producing at P1, let's say they banned, just banned button imports. Okay, and so all of a sudden, these firms in Vietnam had to now meet the demand in Vietnam for the buttons. So given the domestic demand, just the um, just this demand curve here, they could obviously produce it at a price of P4. Now this is higher than what they could if trade had been opened up internationally. But remember, when trade was opened up internationally, they couldn't compete. The price was up here. So certainly the price domestically would be at P4. Yeah. So this is lower than the Vietnamese consumers would be better off because they're able to pay a price lower than that previous world price of P1. Oops, sorry. And so, again, it comes back to the implications of this because one of the potential implications is, well, uh, maybe we should not worry about this whole idea of free trade. If Vietnam is going to be better off by putting up 100% or complete barriers to imports of buttons, then shouldn't, number one, the implication, sh should they be able to do this? Or would they be better off doing this? But second of all, I think one of the more interesting implications of this is that it gives rise to one of the most common um, arguments, if you like, about um, having tariffs, putting tariffs on, and we're going to we're going to look at this issue a couple of times um, in subsequent videos. But it, this is the, the essentially the idea of the in, what we call the infant industry argument. 
So the infant industry argument is, is that, well, we know that eventually we reckon, we think that um, we're going to get economies of scale here. We're going to be able to produce this good at a much lower cost and therefore price than other countries. But at the moment, we can't. All right. So let's put protection on this industry. Let's put up tariffs, that sort of thing. Allow our industry to get started. And then this industry can get these economies of scale move down the um, their average cost curve until they get to a point where they are basically competitive with the rest of the world, which it, as it stands in this example, remember, was China with its average costs being able to sell it at P1. Once you're at that stage, you can get rid of the protection because you now have the advantage and in theory, the price should go all the way down to P2 because you take over the world domination, if you like, of this product and everyone's going to be better off because you're going to be do it, able to do it at a lower price. Now, obviously, that is one of the arguments for this infant industry idea, but of course, it's not as simple as that and we're going to come back to this issue later and talk about why uh, there are many reasons to suggest that even this is not necessarily a good argument for putting up tariffs and non-tariff barriers on um, imported goods.